Viewers of my channel will recall my several videos involving the Cosmac Elf computer from the uh, mid-1970s, which was a uh, very entry-level uh, computer trainer, really, for the 1802 microprocessor. In 1977, Joseph Weisbecker of RCA, who was a co-developer of the 1802 microprocessor and also the designer of the ELF computer, developed a commercial product based on the ELF for RCA. This was the so-called Cosmac VIP, or also called the RCA VIP, but I believe Cosmac VIP was the correct name. It was really architecturally the same kind of design as the ELF, but it had expansions of the kind that Weisbecker himself had suggested in pages of the same magazine that he originally described the ELF in. Uh, some of those articles in the magazine included adding a video chip to the ELF, adding a hex keyboard interface so you didn't have to use toggle switches to enter hexadecimal programming. And the VIP included that kind of thing already bundled in. Whereas the ELF had only 256 bytes of memory, or of RAM, and no ROM, at least natively, uh, the VIP had, uh, I believe it was 2K of RAM, and it could be expanded to double that on the board, or more using these expansion slots on the top. Uh, the VIP did include a video display IC, Again, very similar to the video that you'd get from putting the same IC on the ELF. It had the ability to use an ASCII keyboard for input by plugging in a keyboard interface module into one of the expansion slots. It had a built-in cassette interface for saving and loading programs. And uh, the whole thing was bundled, as you see it here, for $275, and that was in 1977 dollars. Uh, that's roughly $1,200 today. Uh, there was also in the VIP a small monitor program that took roughly 512 bytes, and uh, within that monitor program you were able to view and modify memory and execute programs and via an expansion card you could get an additional uh, ROM that included a tiny basic program. Here's a view of the circuit board of the VIP. So you've got your 1802 processor here, you've got your native RAM and the expansion RAM. Um, up here I believe is the video chip and um, some support logic Somewhere on here is the uh, cassette interface, probably down here, I'm guessing. Um, had the hex keypad built in already. Uh, it had the QLED, just like the ELF. It had an LED to tell you that the uh, tape was operating for saving and loading. It had a run and reset toggle switch and a power LED. Very basic stuff. Um, the company I worked for in the uh, late 70s decided they were going to standardize on the VIP computer for automating uh, test fixtures in our circuit board assembly department. And I was charged with utilizing that, so I became pretty familiar with the VIP. Originally, I just used it uh, programming an 1802 machine code using the hex keypad and since there was no native display on here, you had to use the video output if you're going to see what you were doing. Um, so unlike the ELF, it was not self-contained. You needed to have something like the video monitor plugged in. And if you were going to write programs, you needed to connect a cassette uh, tape recorder to it. And we always had the uh, keyboard interface plugged into one of the connectors. And then the uh, expansion... ROM card with the Tiny Basic. Uh, so eventually I wrote a front end using the Tiny Basic, but still had the uh, 
core of the automation program running in 1802 machine code. Just as with um, many other early single board computers from the 70s, uh, just to name a couple of them, the Cosmac VIP and the Kim 1 would be a couple examples, uh, or for that matter an Apple 1. Um, the ones that still exist tend to be pretty hard to find and when they do show up on places like eBay the price is a really steep and prohibitive for almost anybody who's not a very serious collector or maybe a museum. Um, this is actually a pretty nice listing here. It's new old stock so it's not even been used. It's got the original box, it's got all the manuals and stuff so it's a really nice package but $2,500 is ouch. Anyway, for this reason I've never been able to afford to come up with a VIP of my own. Um, I'm kind of sad I didn't glom onto one of the ones from the uh, company I used to work for when they were uh, being liquidated and probably nobody would have noticed if I'd taken one but I'm an honest person so I didn't do it. Some of my other videos have mentioned the name of Lee Hart who's a uh, an engineer who's done a lot of retro computing designs over the years. A number of them are available as kits. Um, I've included on one of my retro computer videos his 1802 membership card which is essentially a repackaged Cosmac ELF computer on a tiny board set that fits into an Altoids tin, one of Lee's favorite uh, conceits if you will seeing what he can jam into Altoids tins. It's a pretty nice kit. Um, I've also done a video involving the Z80 membership card which is a similar concept but it's a Z80 based computer. Um, a little bit more advanced that actually has a monitor program in it and a uh, hexadecimal display and a hexadecimal keypad and that works really well. I've done another video on his face card, which is an 1802 based uh, fun project that makes faces at you with LEDs and in a very clever way that doesn't use any memory or program for that matter. I also have a video on a non processor kit from Lee Hart, which is the electronic Christmas tree. His newest kit, as of late 2018, is the 40th Anniversary VIP 2K. Unlike the Wikipedia entry, um, Lee Hart's website, which is sunriseev.com, uh, says that the VIP was created in 1978 and instead of 1977, so there's some disparity in sources as to when it came out, but that's sort of moot. Lee's website describes the original VIP and then he talks about how 2018 is the 40th anniversary and uh, it actually takes two boxes, an Altoids tin and then a battery box that goes adjacent to it. You can't fit the batteries into the box. The VIP 2K as the 1802 microprocessor, 32K of RAM, 32K of ROM containing a monitor program and BASIC, an NTSC black and white uh, video output composite video, a 43 key full ASCII keyboard although it's tiny little keys, and it's built entirely using vintage parts and through hole uh, components and traditional circuit boards. There's no surface mount or anything cute. Doesn't have any microcontrollers. It's all done using legitimate 1970s technology. Granted the uh, uh, RAM chip that's used is a newer style of RAM chip that has higher density but it's still really pretty old school. This is really a joint project between Chuck Yakum and Lee Hart. 
uh, with I believe Lee doing the hardware design and Chuck doing the software and um, these were available at the 2018 Vintage Computer Festival Midwest but at that time it was just running as a TV typewriter so the software much like this here this is a uh, um, pretty much what it looked like at the show. Uh, the video was kind of rough. Uh, there were still some timing issues because the video is being bit banged out by the software. There's no video chip on this uh, VIP 2K. So you have to do a lot of messing around with the software to get the timing exactly right. And as of the show you could type things on the little keyboard and it would display on the uh, video screen as a TV typewriter but you couldn't really do any monitor work or run basic. Since that time, the uh, software has improved dramatically, and I've bought one of the early kits that is available as a full kit, including the monitor and the basic. So that's the project video that I'm going to be doing here, showing the building and a demonstration of the VIP 2K. Okay, so here's what comes with the kit. There's a tube full of smaller ICs. Two circuit boards, one with the actual computer. And you can see here it's an extremely high density design, at least considering that it's through-hole technology and not surface mount. There are instances of ICs being mounted under other ICs. So there's at least three ICs here which fit underneath other chips. And here's another one, so four instances. Uh, so it's really squeezed in here. Very clever board design. Lee Hart really does a nice job of figuring out how to jam lots of chips into a small board. And then the uh, keyboard, uh, which I don't think it has any other function other than the keyboard, uh, although I think it may include, um, well it's just got pass-through holes for the video signal and the power and serial connector. It also has um, serial. Um, and then you've got your Altoids tin which are included with these things. And the uh, remainder of the parts are in there, the majority of the parts actually. So here's the whole set of parts. Start out with all the tiny little tactile key switches, the two circuit boards, smaller ICs, bigger ICs. Um, IC sockets are provided for uh, the microprocessor and the EEPROM. And then there's a various uh, types of headers and connectors. These may actually be used as another IC socket. Um, I'm not sure, i got to read the instructions. Then there's a couple of diodes, three fixed uh, axial resistors, three resistor networks, a uh, ceramic resonator used instead of a crystal, a couple of transistors, um, some small, looks like decoupling type capacitors, or used for decoupling rather, a couple of uh, probably tantalum electrolytics, well, tantalum capacitors, let's put it that way. A uh, brief assembly notes, as it's called. It's not an assembly manual. That would take too long, as it says here. So you're expected to be reasonably proficient with electronics and ICs and circuit boards and so on and figure out a lot of it yourself. Um, he mentions here again the features, the 1802 microprocessor running at 4 megahertz, 32K of RAM, 32K of ROM, which includes the monitor program and a version of BASIC, NTSC black and white video output with 192 by 192 pixel graphics, uh, 43 key full ASCII keyboard, TTL level serial I.O. port, up to 9600 baud, built entirely with vintage parts and technology, and it fits in the Altoids tin. It is still under development, so um, 
any number of things might change on this over time, primarily the firmware. So there's a uh, parts list, um, and it mentions things like uh, this 1802 runs at 4 megahertz. 1802s are really only specified to 2.5 megahertz or uh, 3.5 megahertz for some later versions, which means you have to select a fast enough 1802. So far, Lee Hart has found that most early non A type 1802s are too slow, but most later 1802As easily run at 4 megahertz. Some will go up to as fast as 12 megahertz. So he has to go through and select. Uh, chips before he ships them with the kit. Uh, there's some basic assembly instructions, very brief. And then there's some notes on testing it. And there is a schematic diagram on two pages. And that is the instructions. Here's a close up of the main circuit board. Front and back. And the first step is to install the three axial lead resistors, at least one of which fits underneath an IC. Uh, there's two of them. So I've got the three axial resistors and the three small ceramic capacitors that are used for decoupling and then the two small signal diodes. So um, some of the ICs go into sockets and some of them go underneath sockets for larger ICs. For example the RAM IC here goes underneath the socket and hence underneath the chip for the uh, uh, main EEPROM and the I think that's the main EEPROM. And then um, this IC goes underneath the socket and hence the chip for the video generation EEPROM, which is a separate EEPROM. And then these two ICs go underneath the socket and hence the chip for the 1802 microprocessor. These other four chips here uh, don't go underneath anything else. Sockets are not included for these chips, um, but I like the socket things as much as possible. So I pulled some sockets out of my parts bin and put those on. Uh, it's actually possible to use a, uh, a special zero height uh, so-called socket pin. And there's actually a, a reference to it here, a DigiKey part number ED5037-ND, which is an extreme low profile pin that can be used as a socket and um, adds almost no height to the uh, assembly but um, I don't have them on hand and I didn't want to delay this another four or five days while I wait for a digikey order so I just went ahead and soldered those ICs in directly there is a uh, noted error on the circuit board, for the Rev-A circuit board anyway, which uh, has pin 15 of this IC, that's IC11. It's currently tied to VCC, um, so the pin is pin 15, VCC is pin 16. They were jumpered together on the board. That foil needs to be cut, and then pin 15 needs to be taken down to ground, which is pin 8, so this uh, short jumper wire is put in there. The uh, instructions actually put this step after installing the ICs, even though it says to do it before installing the ICs, so I think the instruction order is a little backwards. It doesn't much matter because all the modifications are done on the back side of the board anyway, so you can get to it whether or not the IC or socket's been installed uh, already. Then Q1 went in next, and that's because it has to fit underneath the IC socket for the 2716 EEPROM. So this is a typical problem with putting these sockets on here. They're, uh, 
the two sides are supported by bars between them, but those bars interfere with the ICs under them, so those need to be cut first. Rather like this. And so all the ICs are on there now. In their dual layers. And then the three resistor networks go on. And then the uh, other resistor, the one that's not under an IC socket. And then the ceramic resonator, which is used instead of a crystal. Had to pull the microprocessor out of its socket in order to get in that small space. I think I'll actually leave it out till I solder in that capacitor next to it. Alright, so the two tantalum capacitors are soldered in now, and I just need to plug the 1802 back into its socket. And then there are three two-pin headers. These two are used as feet to support the lower corners of the keyboard circuit board, and don't have an electrical function. And then these two up here are used for the video output. And then finally, the headers for the keyboard circuit board go on there. The first group of uh, 10 pins is for the rows, and the next one with 6 pins is for the columns. We already did the video output, and then there's a 6 pin header, which is not for the keyboard, it's for the um, serial I.O. So now for the keyboard. This starts out by putting stacking connectors on it which will mate with the headers along the top of the main computer board. And then this uh, six position one needs to have the middle couple pins pulled out. Ending up with a couple of two position ones. And those go down here. And after soldering, then the excess leads are cut off. Then there are these remaining uh, six power and serial connectors and two video connectors or pins. And it looks like this remaining, uh, what is it, uh, 10 position stacking connector will be used to pass through this board without making connection. But I have to pull out a couple of pins first. Like this. I have a feeling it might come a little too close to that other header. We'll see. Might have to trim a little bit off. Just like that. And now these pins stick up here so they can be accessed. I think they're exceptionally long. At this point, the arduous task of soldering on all these, uh, how many it is, it's 43 tactile switches onto the board. And the ones furnished with the kit are actually the surface mount. Let's see if I can get it to focus. The surface mount version 
so the pins all need to be bent down so they'll fit the circuit board. Well, halfway done. And I've got all the switches in except for the space. And there are two switches left, so one of them is a spare. And here's the completed keyboard. All the switches are soldered from the front, so there's little solder coming through from the back. They're soldered on as if they were surface mount. Even with the surface mount pin leads bent down, they don't go all the way through the holes. It's just enough to keep them centered. And it's very tight to solder in between the rows of switches to get the uh, pins that are in between there. And the pads are very small. So unless you have a fairly fine point soldering iron with a fairly long nose, you might not be able to get in there. Alright, the first test is to make sure that the 1802 CPU will actually run at 4 MHz. They're not designed to run that fast, but many of them do. The uh, kit as it comes has a pre-tested 1802 that should be good at at least 4 MHz. And an easy way to tell whether it is or isn't is to do this first test. Uh, to number one, check that it's oscillating at the correct frequency, uh, that its clock is oscillating at the correct frequency, and, and then also to check that it's within a reasonable voltage range, uh, because that voltage range will have to trigger other circuitry on the computer, and it needs to be within reasonable logic levels. I've got the VIP powered up. I've got my scope set here for on the 10 times probe. This is a high impedance circuit. I'm using my 10 times probe. 2 volts per division. And uh, I go down and look at pin 39 on the CPU. And uh, let's see if we can adjust this. So looking at that peak right there, that's one division. And it's one, two and a half divisions uh, to the next peak, so that's its period. And it's a uh, 0.1 microseconds per division, so it's 0.25 microseconds. Take the reciprocal of that, and that's 4 megahertz. So it's definitely oscillating at 4 megahertz as it should be. Um, I'm checking here to see what the voltages are. That's um, ground and uh, 2 volts per division it's uh, almost 5 volts so it's got a nice healthy swing in voltage that should be enough I've got my little VGA monitor here and I'm using the composite input I've rigged up a cable that plugs in there with the appropriate pins to go on here and the video generation logic circuit it doesn't use a video generation IC it's all done with brute force um, plain digital logic and uh, it runs autonomously from the CPU so just turning it on should generate something so let's see what happens nothing and it's got a blank screen here which suggests that it is getting a signal it's just a blank signal so I'm going to go and move on to the next step and see if I can get this to generate some text well, I've just replugged things here um, and now I seem to be getting some sort of video even though it's not coordinated video going to force the processor to reset by temporarily grounding the reset input. Doesn't make any difference. And what kind of signals do we have coming out of the 
scope here. Well, there's something being generated there. And at uh, half a volt per division, it's running up towards one volt, which I think is about right. And um, it's obviously trying to do something. Assuming that the processor won't do its job unless it can scan the keyboard. I've got the keyboard plugged in now. Everything else is on there the same way as it should be and uh, I'm going to turn the power back on. Well, that was garbage. Oh, there we go. VIP 2K monitor version 1.1 enter H for help. I push the H button and it's giving me a bunch of stuff. It's kind of bleedy here. So it's scrolling very slowly. Now this is probably a rather sloppy video signal and that's probably why it's got so much color bleed here. And it says press B to run basic. So, um, welcome to the 1802 RCA Basic version 1.1 CW. I don't know what that means. Let's see if I push um, C. Now, of course, you have to deal with this tiny little keyboard. Oops. Ah. I heard that the uh, way the current version 1.1 software is written, it's real touchy with the key presses. have to be deliberate, but not too long on the presses. And um, <clears throat> there's no characters on the keyboard for punctuation. And I need to put the equal sign in. And there's a little chart here off of Lee Hart's website, which says I need to push Control-0 for equal. So that's a double finger thing. Let's see if I can make it work. I have to put the camera down for that. Okay, that worked. One, two, oops, at least it has the backspace, that's a big plus. Um,
keyboard is definitely touchy. And I don't know if this version of BASIC requires the end or not, but it shouldn't hurt to put it in. Okay, let's see what happens if I list it. Not exactly a speed demon, but it's working. I'm going to try a, in, a uh, immediate command here. Oops. And a uh, quotation mark is... Where is it here? Quote, control Q. Have to use two hands for this. do the old control Q again. And then hit enter. And it printed hello world. So basic is essentially functioning correctly on the VIP 2K. Well, I haven't figured out how to escape BASIC and get back into the monitor other than to power cycle it. And the circuit doesn't seem to be terribly robust uh, as far as power cycling goes. Um, seems like about one out of every five times I cycle power I'm able to actually get an intelligible display. The rest of the time it just gives me garbage or a blank screen. So things are a little bit on the edge there I think. And um, I looked at this before and said I didn't know what the C and the W meant. It turns out that refers to cold start or warm start of BASIC. If it's the first time I'm running BASIC since uh, I've reset the computer, I need to use the C option because it's a cold start. And that causes BASIC to initialize certain registers and things that it needs to run properly. Um, Subsequently, if I leave BASIC and go to the machine language monitor, for example, then come back into BASIC, I can use the W option, which leaves all the uh, initialization of BASIC alone as it was before, and just jump straight into running BASIC. I'm not really sure what the advantage of that is. I don't think there's a significant uh, time savings. I think it's negligible. But that's what that's all about. And if you try to run a if you try to run BASIC with the W option when it's really the first time it's been run since resetting, then it will crash, which I found would happen. I would get one line of BASIC in and then it would crash. Um, and that was the reason for that. So it's probably safe to always use the C option. And I'm just going to put in a little program here. One line program without a line number. Oops. <laughs> I never gave it the C option. I'm screwing it up here. So now let me try that again.
in the previous example I did just a few seconds ago, it wasn't backspacing and erasing, it was just backspacing. And the reason it was doing that was because I hadn't initialized basic either with the C or the, the W. I was just trying to run it straight away. So, um, I'm going to pretend to be HAL 9000 here. So now that I've put a little basic program in and run it, I want to get back into the machine language monitor. And it wasn't documented, but the command is supposedly by. Yes, that does take it back to the monitor, so that's good. There was also a question of how to get the escape key. The documentation mentions escape key specifically as a key, but there is no escape key on the VIP2K keyboard. Turns out that has to be accessed with a control code, and it would be control number one. There's actually a whole table. I was able to get some additional documentation uh, that answered a number of those questions. So a number of improvements have been made here in the operation of the VIP2K. I'm still hoping to get an answer on how to mod this to alleviate some of the uh, resetting issues regarding the uh, video generation so that it boots up a little more cleanly and reliably. But let me just see if I can tickle the monitor program a little bit. Um, before I do that I'm going to do help again uh, because hopefully it has some additional instructions that aren't on the website and maybe I can slow this down uh, and write down some of what it says. It scrolls too fast for me to read it. Uh, in the monitor program, the M command, here's actually a list of the monitor commands, M for reading memory, W for writing memory, T for transferring memory, R to run the program, that's the machine language program, not the basic program, view registers upon entry is V, D is a disassembler, B gets you into the basic from the monitor, S saves the user's machine language program, L loads it, and that would be um, from the serial port. And the website says those commands aren't actually implemented yet, so I'm not even going to try those. A supposedly gives you an about. I'm going to try that right now. The VIP2K membership card. The design is by Lee Hart in 2018. The VIP2K monitor program is by Chuck Yakum. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, in 2018. And the RCA Basic 3 program is by Ron Senker uh, from 1981. Uh, the schematic has um, 32, shows 32K of uh, ROM, or EEPROM, and 32k of RAM. Uh, when address bit 15 is logic 0, then the EEPROM chip is enabled. So we know that the um, EEPROM is at low memory. And then once A15 turns on, which puts you into the second 32k of memory space, then you go through this inverting function and that goes to the chip enable for the RAM. So that means when A15 is turned on, then the RAM works. So it's obviously in the upper uh, 32K space. Uh, that would be the memory map. So just a quick sketch here. Um, 
ROM is from 0, 0, 0, 0 hex to 7 or yeah 7 FFF hex RAM starts at 8 0, 0, 0 hex and goes up through FFFF hex so right now I ought to be able to take a look at some memory contents and uh, the command of taking a look is the letter M and then a hexadecimal address a space then another hexadecimal address or the second one's not a address it's actually the number of bytes you want to look at so I'm going to go here and type an M and then I'm going to put in um, well I'll just put in the first address zero it doesn't need leading zeros according to the instructions then I put in a space and I want to look at the first 16 well let's look at the first eight bytes so that's true in hexadecimal or in uh, decimal and then I hit the return key and it displays addresses 000 through 4567 let me try that again with an M 0 find out if this is expecting hexadecimal or decimal it doesn't actually say it's probably hexadecimal so I'm going to put in um, F for 16 and see if it interprets that well F is the hexadecimal equivalent of 15 so it actually displayed the first 15 addresses I was thinking 16 but F is 15 not 16 so I need to try that again memory 0 space and then one zero hex there that was what I intended so it does expect that argument to be in hexadecimal so the monitor program is working there it's displaying memory now I want to go to um, write something into memory let's take a look at the memory at location eight zero 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 Oop. that seemed to have crashed let's try it again memory eight zero 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 Try it again. Okay. It crashed. Okay. <laughs> well, the RAM has to be working or BASIC wouldn't work. But for some reason it's choking on that upper memory. What if I take a look at memory? 7 F F F function aborted well I think it was just crashing because I wasn't stipulating the number of bytes to display so it actually crashes the monitor instead of giving a, an error message again this uh, programming is very preliminary and not very mature yet so this time I'm putting in display memory location starting at 8000 hex for 8 hex locations and see if it takes that there we go that's the trick just need to follow the syntax which is apparently a little bit picky I thought like some other monitor programs I've used if you don't put in the second argument it just displays that one address so I want to write some stuff into memory and by writing I should be able to put anything I want in here because I'm just using machine language unless of course the monitors using these locations we'll find out I guess so I'm going to write at 8 
zero 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 space zero one space zero zero space F F space and eight zero space. So I'm writing one zero F and eight zero. Now I'm going to take a look at those locations. Zero zero F eight zero eight B seven. So apparently the monitor program overwrites that. Let me try it again. I didn't see any provided memory maps, so I'm just guessing at stuff here. I'm going to write at um oh let's try E zero 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 Okay, just zero through four at E zero zero zero. Ah. Memory E zero. Well, once again, it overwrote what I had there with something. I think the program's basically working, but I don't understand the memory map, and I'm probably tromping on some memory that is not available for my use. Anyway, I think the monitor program is essentially functional. I've got some more information on the memory map. Apparently, it's still pretty dynamic, changing from a firmware revision to the next firmware revision, but at the moment, for the version 1.1 that I'm running, the user RAM is starting at hex 8000 and going up through hex E7BF, uh, so I should be able to change memory in that area. And uh, so I'm going to try writing. Uh, I'm going to pick something a little further up, like 9,000 hex. Oops. Try that again. Right. 9, 0, 0, 0, space. I'm going to put something odd, like 66 in there. And then I'm going to monitor nine zero zero zero. Oh, I didn't give it an argument. Ah, I gotta remember that. <sighs> Typo. I need to remember to give it that argument for X number of bytes, so it's going to be one byte that I wanted to report. And it returned 66, which is what I put into it. So that's working. I found a safer area of memory. Now let's try writing again into 9000 hex. 
I'm going to put in several values. I'm going to put in 0, 1, um, 1, 0, F, F, and oh, what am I going to do? Let's put BB in there. So 0, 1, 1, 0, F, F, B, B. Now I'm going to monitor 9000 zero, 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 and I want four uh, memory locations to be reported. 0110FFBB. So that part of the monitor is working now. I just had to find a safe area of user RAM. I think it would be interesting to disassemble something, so I'm going to try that. I know there's uh, ROM at the lowest locations, and the dissembler is uh, letter D for the command, and then uh, starting address and ending address. So let's try that. So disassemble zero 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 space. Um, and I don't need the leading zero, so I should be able to just put in 15 to go up through 0, zero 15 or 1, 5. There we go. It's providing a disassembly listing. Pretty cool. So I would say the VIP 2K, in spite of this very early version of uh, ROM, is essentially functional. It has some commands that aren't fully implemented or implemented at all. Um, it's a little iffy on getting started um, so that it displays intelligible stuff on the screen, but um, it does work. And I expect with future uh, EEPROM updates that uh, many of those things will be improved. So yes, the VIP2K does fit inside the Altoids tin. The uh, tops of the tactile buttons come right up to the lid level. Uh, of course, you can't use it with the lid closed, but it'd be cool if it could be used for storage. That doesn't really happen here because the power supply and video pins stick out the top. I think it would have been nicer if those had been female so that... Um, so a plug could be plugged on there or plugged into it instead of having this be the male part. Of course, it can be disassembled. So this connector is taken off. Actually, I could probably even just lay it along the top here and it would probably still close. Let's see. Yeah, that works. So it can be stored inside the Altoids tin, but to use it you have to take it out and pull the two boards apart, stick this in there, and then put it back together again. So not quite optimal, but still pretty good. Alright, I've decided to fix this connector issue. Um, I've desoldered carefully. 
the um, two pin headers for the video, the power, and the serial. And I'm going to solder the stacking header into the board in this direction. But I'm going to be putting in some fairly short headers through the keyboard into here, so I want it to be up higher than it would normally be. So I'm going to push it up like that and solder it that way. This is a set of uh, mail headers I found in my junk box. And I pull one pin out. I was looking for the ones with the longest pins because I think that'll be necessary. Could probably stand to be longer, but I think this will work. I've stuck my uh, mail header into the stacking header to keep it in alignment with the, uh, the holes in the board before I solder it up. And now that that's soldered, I just need to clip off these long pins. So um, I've cut out the middle piece. This allows the video and the power to be separately unplugged. These just plug in pretty easily. Like this. I just need to solder on my leads now. Um, unfortunately I had them already put into the Molex connectors like this which is unfortunate but um, I'm going to actually make up an alternate um, plug set that's just going to be soldered directly onto these uh, and then keep these uh, because in the future I may buy a longer set of uh, headers like this that are maybe equally long on both sides of the plastic strip so I can go back to using these. I think it'll be neater if I do so but right now to get it working I'm going to just solder on some spare leads to these right here. So I've got my video and power conductors soldered up to the two headers like this. Kinda rough and dirty. I didn't use any insulators on them or anything. It'll be fine for this purpose. Okay, so I've got that modification made. There are some other revelations here. Um, I had a communication with Lee Hart, the creator of this kit, and he confirmed that the color fringing I'd been seeing on the monitor with the text, some of the yellow and a bit of blue casting around the characters is a common phenomenon when you're using a modern um, color monitor with these primitive uh, NTSC signals. The pixel size is quite different from what the monitor expects and uh, it ends up trying to put pixels kind of in between other pixels or overlaying pixels and it doesn't convert well and therefore the monitor kind of gets confused and uh, shows some stuff it shouldn't show and it's pretty much unavoidable. It could be avoided if the monitor can be convinced that it's receiving a black and white signal um, instead of a color one, but it always assumes you're sending it a color signal these days. And if you could convince it of that, then um, that fringing issue and the aliasing uh, would either be much lessened or not there at all. So I just plug in my video signal here. And I plug in my power connector. I don't have any wires on there for the transmit and receive serial yet, just the power. So there's that. So my power supply is back on and I'm gonna see if I can get this guy to uh, run properly with my modification. Well, I've got the random garbage there and as I point out elsewhere in this video, it turns out this is a result of a, a glitch in the physical design. The autonomous video generation circuit doesn't always get properly initialized relative to the uh, processor, so the only way around it right now is to just cycle the power. And the easiest way for me to do that is just repeatedly remove and replug the power until it comes up correct. Okay, so there's that. And here's that uh, aliasing, uh, fringing, shadowing, haloing, various names for it. 
And again, that's unavoidable unless I can convince the monitor to ignore the color aspect of the signal. but at least it's working with this uh, other approach. And of course now with this mod I don't have to do anything with disassembling the circuit boards in order to be able to have the VIP2K in its Altoids tin and close. So I think that's a good solution. On these kits I always like to go over the schematic if I have one. and. Uh, so I just thought I would do that here. This is a, a better schematic than the one that's in the manual. It's available as a single page and I printed it out on 11 by 17 paper so it'll be legible. So uh, let's start out here with the 1802 which is of course the core of the system. It's got the uh, ceramic resonator with its uh, resistor and the capacitors are built into the resonator. This uh, generates the dot signal which is used by the video generation and um, this was the thing I was initially having trouble with because I was trying to monitor this point using the 1x um, setting on my scope and the impedance is too low that way and it loads this down too much so it wasn't working that way so that was uh, a thing I was being a little dim about working too late at night and the brain cells weren't all firing correctly. Um, the data bus is brought out and the 1802 has that 8-bit address bus which serves the high and the low bytes of the 16-bit address by sequentially putting one half on the bus and then the other half. Here is the address latch which takes those eight address bus pins and latches them to form A8 through A15 which is the higher order half of the address. So now we have A0 through A15 on the bus and um, here's the 32K EEPROM which holds the program and it uses address 0 through address 14. Um, address 15 of course is the bit that has to flip to use the lower 32K or the upper 32K and the fact that address 15 has to be low to uh, operate the chip enable which is a low going chip enable or negative acting chip enable uh, that tells us that the EEPROM is in the lower 32K of memory and other than that it has um, the um, memory read signal from the processor coming in is the output enable which allows it to put its memory contents on the data bus and here is the data bus connection. Right below it is the 32K RAM, it's a static RAM and once again it has addresses 0 through 14 and you don't see address 15 coming in but of course it needs it uh, but here is where it goes. It needs to be inverted because in this case the RAM is in the upper 32K so it needs A15 to be logically true, but the various uh, output enables and chip enables are all negative acting. So this uh, NAND gate here is used as an inverter to flip A15 to its opposite state and thereby enable the RAM chip when A15 is logically true. So that's how the RAM and the ROM are accessed and wired up. Now the 1802 has a built-in I.O. capability even though it doesn't have a lot of dedicated I.O. pins. It does have EF1 through EF4 right here which are dedicated input pins and um, EF1 is brought out and used elsewhere I believe somewhere in the circuit uh, EF2, 3, and 4 are all pulled high. Um, they're negative acting. And EF4 is used uh, and brought out to the expansion connector, which is not used by the kit, but it's available. And also, it comes down to one of the uh, pins on the serial connector. So this is obviously used as the uh, receive 
line um, <clears throat> or the RX line so a serial input will either do nothing if it's high or if it's low it'll pull EF4 low through this diode and that's how the processor knows that the serial input is doing something and it can monitor it through EF4. Uh, the white and the clear are just part of the reset structure of the processor and it has a capacitor to ground from the clear so whenever you power it up uh, the capacitor is momentarily shorted while it's charging and that pulls clear to logic low which clears and uh, initializes the 1802. Then there's also a so-called negative on pin that's stuck on the end of the serial connector and that goes through an NPN transistor that can also pull the clear line low so there's ability for external resetting or clearing of the A1002. Um, this is your memory read and write output which get used variously uh, memory read, for example, is used for the uh, EEPROM as an output enable. And memory write is used as the write enable for the RAM. Memory read is used as the output enable for the RAM. So that's all very logical. Um, let's see here. The SC0 and SC1 form uh, binary patterns 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 to tell externally uh, circuitry what mode of the uh, the clock essentially the processor is in because certain operations can only be done during certain parts of the clock cycle or instruction cycle you could look at it that way too. Um, SC0 is not being used here SC1 is being used somewhere else in the circuitry for example over here. The 1802 supports seven inputs and seven outputs uh, which are all addressed through special input output instructions in the processor. Um, it's basically putting data out on the data bus or reading data on the data bus depending if it's a read or write I.O. instruction and the way you access those devices or enable those devices is through the N0 through N2 pins. These are outputs and between them they form eight possibilities in binary. The 0, 0, 0 possibility is disallowed so you've always got one of these pins at least turned on uh, essentially binary 1 through binary 7 which gives you your seven possibilities. Uh, to use those in this circuit those are all brought directly to a uh, I believe it's a BCD to, uh, well a BCD decoder is what it is. Um, it takes those seven possible states and converts them to one of these states, not all of which are being used. Um, so for example, The, uh, one of the outputs here can pull this low and that in turn is used way over here as part of the keyboard circuit. The next, what is it, uh, five lines, only one of which can be true at a time. I think these are logic low, so only one of which can be logic low at a time depending on the binary codes here. Those are the keyboard column scan lines and um, then another one of these possibilities is used over here through this transistor and it's used as part of the uh, video generation circuit uh, coordinating that activity with the processor. I would suspect that that may be where the processor is actually determining which uh, ASCII code should be sent out to the uh, video signal. That would be my guess without further study of this. Anyway, so that's how the processor is able to determine what it wants to do as far as I.O. And up here you've got your data bus going into this uh, latch. I think that's what it is. Oh, I see it is. It's U11. It's a shift register, actually. It's not a latch. So it 
takes parallel data coming in and then it shifts it out serially through the QH or you could use the inverted output but we're only using the non-inverted output and um, the dot signal which remember comes off of the oscillator circuit so that's running at 4 megahertz and that signal here is brought in and that's the clock that clocks this parallel data out serially here and there's no chip enable on this except for the inhibit signal is tied low this is actually the modification I made earlier with the jumper on the bottom of the circuit board I showed during the assembly stage um, this was incorrectly thought to be uh, something that needed to be pulled to logic high uh, and in fact it needed to be pulled to logic low so I had to make a foil cut and then jumper pin 15 to circuit ground so that's correctly shown here uh, SC1 once again that comes from here and TPB is another signal that the 1802 uses to coordinate activities between its internal workings and external circuitry and that's uh, part of your uh, load and shift mode selector for this chip and that drives here into your video output the video outputs right here as direct as could be there's the ground pin and there's the uh, composite video output uh, there's a sync signal that's generated elsewhere in the logic and a blank signal and those are coupled in through this uh, resistor network into the common of the resistor network the actual video signal is brought in this way through two of those resistors paralleled and then uh, what does it look like uh, one two three four five of the resistors paralleled are going to ground so this forms uh, essentially a little um, digital to analog converter of sorts that depending on the data and the sync and the blank it's going to generate the correct level of video signal so that um, the monitor knows what to do with the video signal. Now I already mentioned that the key column for key scanning was generated directly off of this chip and the key rows are generated off of this chip here which is an 8-bit latch. Once again the data bus goes into it and it's gated by this signal which comes over here out of memory read and oh yeah this signal right here it says whether it's high for an input or um, high for an input or an output instruction so it's essentially saying whenever any of these is active then it must be doing an input or output instruction so it comes through here and it gates the memory uh, read or not memory read through and that acts as the gate to bring this data from here into here. I'm not sure that's actually a latch. It's a 74244. I don't remember offhand if that's a latch or just a gated buffer. Either way it passes the data on the data bus through to here. Well I'm sorry it's probably going the other way isn't it? Because this is tied in from read. I think that what's happening here is that the columns are generated from this and they go into the keyboard matrix and then depending on which key you push it's being read back through this that's why the pull-up resistors are here it's being read back through this and then put on the data bus and read back by the processor so that's the way that's working and here's your uh, keyboard again we know we've got five columns being driven column one two three four five column one two three four five so essentially two groups of five by four keys and then row zero row one um, does it say oh yeah row two and row three and then row let's see row four picks up the backspace key and these three keys down here and the space key 
and then the remaining three rows are brought in as row 5, row 6, and row 7. So that's how all the keyboard keys are scanned in. And that only leaves the video circuit, which frankly I don't understand. I haven't spent enough time studying it. But I know in general it's all done with this one shift register chip already mentioned, and then these three chips here. This one's actually a second EEPROM, which is the video sequencer. My understanding is this operates like a state machine, and it just feeds back around like this. You've got a video latch, you've got a video counter, and the video sequencer. So the counter is counting up, it's sending its information out here into the address lines of this EEPROM, and depending on which address is there, the EEPROM kicks out whatever data is stored at that address, which will be not so much data here, but a binary pattern, and that's being read in as data in this video latch. The latching, um, let's see, it's being clocked by the TPA, which again is a coordination signal from the processor. And from that, it's generating the blank signal, the sync signal, and the EF1 signal, which we touched on before. It's being brought back in here as an input to the processor. So uh, there's a whole bunch of text here on how the horizontal timing is being done and how the vertical timing is being done for generation of the NTSC signals. And it's really written for somebody who might try writing their own code, and there could be subtle differences uh, between how it's programmed from one programmer to another, but if you buy the kit, that part's already done for you. So that's the overview of the VIP 2K schematic diagram. Well, according to the developer of this computer, the partial fix for the failure for the video system to initialize properly on power-up is due to this TV on latch not being initialized properly. This is actually a, an interesting little latch. This is um, a 74HC374 and it can clock data from the input here to the output. Um, and the way it's being used here is there's actually a inverted on signal coming from this chip and an inverted off signal coming from the same chip. And remember that these are outputs that are controlled by the uh, video or not the video, but the 1802's uh, built-in I.O. handling structure and therefore it's going to select one of these outputs and if it selects one of these by going low then it forces this transistor to conduct which pulls this point high. Conversely, if the other output, the inverted off signal goes low, then it forces this point to go low. And whichever way that is gets latched in here and you end up with this TV on signal which is either on or off depending on what's going on with these two signals. And that gets used back here. It goes into the highest order of the video sequencer EEPROM and my understanding is that uh, this is your reset on power up with the capacitor that pulls the clear line low momentarily on power up or it can be uh, triggered externally from this through this transistor in either case when this goes low by putting a new diode in here and bringing it over here and tying it into the off line that essentially pulls this line low whether this chip is trying to pull it low or not thereby turning this signal off, turning this latch off, and affecting this. So it seems like a pretty painless thing to do. I trace the foils out, and there's this little area along the edge which 
It's not really an expansion connector exactly. The schematic shows that most of the pins are not connected and that's also apparent by just studying the circuit board. I'm not really sure what the point of this is except that maybe it can be used for some sort of user determined expansion. And uh, I found that this pin here on the left where the cathode of this new diode is goes directly to pin 3 of the microprocessor so I've got that diode on there. It's a nice accessible place for it. And then the uh, anode of the diode goes to an unused pin or position on here. And then I ran a short jumper wire over to this resistor, which is this point here. And it's the same as the slash off signal. So that should be that part of the fix. Okay, the following slideshow shows the steps I went through to design and fabricate a keyboard overlay which would fit over the key switches on the VIP2K's keyboard circuit board for the purpose of improving appearance, making it easier to use the keyboard due to greater visibility of the legends instead of being small silk screens on the circuit board that are kind of buried down between the rows of switches they'd be right up front where you're pushing on them and um, I thought this really needed to be done because it was very awkward and slow to type on the keyboard as it comes in the kit. I had several criteria for coming up with this keyboard overlay. The first one was that I didn't want the overlay to be glued to the tactile switches themselves. I thought this would cause a lot of problems and if I ever wanted to change it or get rid of it, it would ruin the switches. Secondly, I wanted the overlay to be level with the tops of the tactile switch buttons, not hanging in space above them. In other words, the tactile switches barely move when you push on them and I didn't want the uh, overlay itself to have to be deflected from its normal straight profile by more than just a hair to activate the switches, so it really needed to lay flush with the tops of the tactile switch buttons. Yeah, I wanted it to be completely undoable and removable if I changed my mind or decided to do it differently, or if it impacted the VIP 2K in some negative way that I didn't foresee. I wanted it to be reasonably durable, not something that looked good but would fall apart after a bit of use. Uh, I wanted it to include at least some of the control codes required for programming in BASIC, such as most of the punctuation needed for BASIC is not included on the silk screen of the keyboard circuit board, so you don't know which key has the extra control codes. And I wanted it to stylistically hark back to something resembling the original VIP, whether the style, the color, or something. So with all those things in mind, uh, let's look at how I went about doing it. I needed some material that was pretty easy to work with to build up the bulk of the height of the spacers I was going to use, but also some material that was pretty robust, especially when cut to a thin dimension. And I settled upon some thin craft plywood and some brass sheet metal that I had laying around. I laminated the plywood and the brass with epoxy and here you can see a side view of it. And then I cut it out into sections and notched it to fit around the keys on the keyboard and then curved the ends that you can see here uh, to match the circuit board profile. Once I had the overall shape of the spacers I sanded the plywood half down to the appropriate thickness so that the spacers overall were the same height as the tops of the tactile switch buttons. I decided on using some small bolts or screws to hold the spacers onto the keyboard circuit board and I found four good locations for those screws. And You can see them marked here on the circuit board with a black sharpie marker along the left and right edges. I then drilled small pilot holes at the four locations in the circuit board and then I placed the spacers in position and drilled through the circuit board pilot holes into the spacers so I'd get exact alignment. Then I enlarged the holes appropriately and drilled 
uh, tap size holes in the brass and then tapped it for 440 threads. I then used my short 440 bolts through the circuit board, through the spacers into the tapped holes in the brass, and you can see here the left and the right spacers and how they line up with the tops of the keys. Because a couple of the bolt heads touched foils on the circuit board, um, I put some little strips of mylar down as insulators so that the screw heads could not touch the foils on the circuit board and this would prevent any short circuits from inadvertently happening. These two photos show the small amount of clearance remaining between the uh, 440 bolt heads and the underlying components on the main circuit board. These days when I need a front panel for any of my retro computer projects I use Front Panel Express and uh, I've also used their free design software to design things uh, that are like front panels but which I'm not actually going to have Front Panel Express make. I started out by specifying a rectangular uh, shape of three and a half by two and an eighth which are the overall dimensions of the VIP 2K and then I specified a color which I thought would resemble the original VIP which was sort of a cerulean blue maybe a bit darker than that. I determined empirically that a font size of about a quarter inch tall for the lettering would be a good size for this keyboard overlay and that all the uh, legends that I'm going to put on the overlay should be center justified to make it easier to position them. I laid out one row of text using a uh, grid that was equivalent to the spacing on the keyboard circuit board and then I copied that row for the other rows and adjusted their positions appropriately. Once all the characters were placed I changed them to the appropriate letters and numbers and then printed out a copy on my black and white laser just as a proof of spacing. With the primary legends in place and proven, I added some additional characters above the primary designations, and these are for the control codes that are necessary to program in BASIC. And uh, I made the control key yellow, and all the uh, key legends that are accessed by the control key also in yellow, so they're color keyed. I decided to make some of the uh, function keys like backspace and carriage return uh, and shift a bit smaller in font size and also a medium gray in color to contrast with the primary and secondary lettering. 3M once had a, a wonderful product called print to last paper which is actually a laser printer printable plastic film. I think it might have been originally developed for the military um, but I bought that stuff and used it a lot, but 3M discontinued it. I bought up all the remaining stock I could get my hands on, and I sacrificed a sheet of that to print out my keyboard overlay. I laid the keyboard circuit board down on the cut out overlay and marked the lines to trim the corners and other dimensions to get it as a good a fit as I could manage. I spread some epoxy on the tops of the brass top edges of the spacers and then pressed the uh, overlay down on there and held it down with some weighted bolts. Here's what it looked like when complete. I did have to trim the top of the overlay down a little bit below the tops of the spacers because I needed to leave room or clearance for the uh, video and power cables to plug in on the top. Here's a side view showing how the overlay lays on top of the switches and here is the completed VIP 2K in its Altoids tin and here's a view of it in operation. This overlay project worked out very well. The keyboard is so much easier to use now and uh, it looks a lot better and it was pretty easy to make. 
I think it took me about three hours start to finish to do the woodworking and the hardware work, laying it out, printing it, gluing it together. So not a big project, and um, I think it was a big success.